I think we're going to take this off. My understanding is we're going to You can sit, gentlemen. I'm going to let you. Bob is declined. Well, Bob, come on up. <laughs> All right, a third member of that uh, esteemed trio now. And by the way, you other vice presidents, we realize you are vice presidents, but well, these are the guiding lights, and you were guiding lights a little later. <laughs> Mr. Fanati, welcome. Well, it's great to see so many people. I realized that in all my time at III, we never had this number of people ever show up for work. <laughs> As I thought about it, it was largely that half our staff was elsewhere in the world, field service, sales, but still uh, our hours were lousy. Um, I wanted Bob to join us because the triple I that we all know would not have existed without Bob and me having met Ed Fredkin at a time when uh, we were running the Western Division of Computer Control. Ed turned out to be a consultant to us. Uh, we together submitted a proposal to large Livermore Labs for a, I guess you'd refer to it as a multiprocessor, uh, something which I think we're still working on today. Uh, Ed is, without a doubt, the brightest guy I've ever worked with. Uh, and he gracefully turned over the presidency to me, provided I would bring Bob Waller with me. Actually, I remember it just slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> just slightly, that I remember I met Bob Waller and I absolutely wanted to get him into the company, but he said he'll come, but only if he can bring Al with him <laughs> his, as his boss. So that's how that happened. You want to say it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, on days like this, you look back at, uh, at history and try to uh, make some sense of it. And I noticed uh, the newspapers today are still dealing with some of the same issues we dealt with back in uh, 19, what was it, 65? Uh, in particular, I noticed that they're having trouble in Houston finding out what bathrooms people should use. Uh, it was somewhere probably uh, in the mid-70s, uh, at the end of a, uh, a, a director's meeting, uh, or staff meeting, uh, I think Terry Togner said, we're having a little trouble with the uh, insurance company. They're not willing to pay the uh, medical benefits to one of the employees. And I said, Jesus, Terry, will all we pay those guys? Make sure that they live up to their obligations. Well, he came and said, I, I don't think you understand. Uh, this is for sex hormones. The employee is, have, is having a sex change. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, you know, we're having enough trouble beating the equal employment opportunities uh, requirements. <laughs> let's, let's be sure he, he or she feels welcome. And that was fine. They closed the meeting. A little while later, Jim Gay slips by the door and says, what bathroom shall I tell it to use? <laughs> uh, I remember back in our days, we used to think a three-man program group programming group could take on the world. Uh, as most of you know, I've uh, moved on from Triple I. I spent five years working on LISP up with uh, Fritz Kunze on, uh, at Franz, and then uh, I joined a, a group to invest in Russia, and I'm now chairman of the board of a company in Russia that does about a billion dollars a year in business called Yandex. It's Russia's uh, answer to Google. Uh, but where we had uh, one, two, or three men on a project, men or women, uh, in Russia, we wouldn't even start the project till we have 40 people. The, uh, and I haven't figured out what they do. <laughs> they're uh, they're uh, 
there's uh, the, uh, the, the difficulty is that the projects grow exponentially. I, I think 99% of the people are talking with one another. Very few are getting the job done, but I haven't been able to influence that. Uh, I'd, uh, Bob has more of a hearing problem than I do, but uh, I think he might have some words about uh, how we all got together. It was a series of accidents. Uh, Bob, can you? And the interesting thing was that the computer control company for Information International, which is CCC IIR, so we called the machine the 303, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> now, you may not want to comment, but something probably you've never heard of. We had an LMI screen for such a reason. Uh, it had three orders, one for CDP1, and the CFR1, and the CFR2, and the CFR3. Uh, all of which are different. Uh, CFR1 was a, a trivial modification compared to the original CC that came along. The CFR2 was an incredibly complex machine uh, which operated until what year? Was that, um, what year did CDP, CFR, did CDP CFR1, CFR2 go? CFR2. Uh, 2 was the high resolution one for Las Vegas. Three or four? They lived forever, I think. Yeah, all of them. They, they were used forever, yeah. But it was used by the AEC. Uh, it, it, it was used until nuclear testing stopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what it was involved with. But, uh, it was a very, very complex machine. And, uh, and you it did something most people thought was impossible That's at right. the time. Uh, in fact, the... Uh, First program of the, the Stargate program it was an MIT graduate student, Bill Martin, and he worked on it for like three months. He finally came to me and he said, "I give up. I'm going to give up programming. I'm never going to program anymore." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, John Hansen came in, and in one month he had that machine running out of juice. Oh, yeah. You, you weren't quite right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not. Um. Tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I came down, I was over in Cambridge, so I come down, and Bill Martin was a graduate student of Marvin Minsky. And uh, so he'd been, uh, I came to the, uh, we were then located on Olympic. Yeah. And uh, I came there, and Bill Martin was working like this. He had a cot in the office, he did not go out of the office day and night. When he was awake, he was working, and when he couldn't stay up anymore, he would sleep on the cot. As soon as he woke up, he'd work again. And he'd written this beautiful code. He, he was a fantastic coder. Uh, he was the key person behind uh, something called Maxima, which turned into Mathematica later. But ba basically, uh, that was a project at MIT. So he was an MIT graduate student who was, you know, supposed to do write this program and here's what here's what his problem was uh, the computer was the DDP 24 <laughs> okay that was a machine that came from the old company of these two guys okay um, and um, it had a Fortran compiler so Bill Martin was very methodical he programs the whole program on paper this isn't my style of program. When he's all done, he compiled it. And it compiled to about 30,000 words. But the machine only had 16,000 <laughs> words. It was 8,000 8, words. Pardon me, it had 8,000 words. So he's feverishly trying to reduce the code and so on and so forth. So I came down there, and I'm having him explain all this to me and so on. And the guy was like bleary-eyed and you know and so on. I said, look, okay, you've explained this to me. Go back to MIT and finish your damn doctorate. And he left, okay, <laughs> went back, okay. So I took the code, and it was just so beautiful. All I did, and it was very easy for me, is I partitioned it because 
part of the code was to sort of calibrate itself. And another part was to do something else. And there was a tape drive on this machine. So I'll, I, I had this trivial job, which I just did by myself, which is I divided this code up into about three or four pieces. And we put the pieces together. The thing that sort of annoyed me, I was going to use the most vulgar explanation, but <laughs> I stopped myself in time, okay, was that Lawrence Radiation Laboratory then hired, when we told them we were done, they said, don't ship it to us yet. And they hired a company to test our machine to see if it made the spec. And they paid them. That company made more profit than we did. <laughs> <laughs> it met all the specs. And from then on, uh, you know, it served, what it did was, when they did a nuclear test, it would get the result <coughs> of uh, a little curve on film. And by reading it, they could figure out what the yield was. And with my gadget, our gadget, triple I gadget, it could do it in an hour, say, while the old way had people working like slaves with a mechanical kind of optical thing would take maybe a week. So this was much faster. Here's a funny sequel. One day, a man comes into the office. He tells me he's from the CIA. And I say, yeah, what do you want? And he says, this isn't Cambridge. And he he says, well, we have reason to believe that the French government is going to want to buy one of your PFR twos. <laughs> and I thought, and I thought, w w what would they want with a PFR two? And he says, well, you know, they're developing nuclear weapons and so on and so forth. <coughs> I thought, <coughs> so the, okay, <coughs> this just struck me as bizarre because this was all highly secret. I had to have a Q clearance, you know, and things like that. And so uh, that meant that there were French spies in the U.S. Atomic Energy <laughs> Agency, and U.S. spies in the French government to know <laughs> that the French government. So I thought they were all cracked. About a week later, a guy comes into the office and says, I'm a, uh, the, uh, he was the, some attache at the French embassy, and he says, we'd like to buy a PFR too. <laughs> So a lot of anecdotes like that. <laughs> 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 uh, so, little secret here. Whenever when I joined the company, it was because of the person who ordered for these free machines <laughs> that was very enticing to us. They had a huge backlog in the, in the company, it was an interesting product, challenging. And so we joined, and, and, and we we're going to join, and uh, Ed's lawyer suggested that we had to put up some earnest money. <laughs> 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 and uh, we invested in it, and uh, we get back to Cambridge, and uh, a gentleman by the name of George Michael wanted to talk to us. And George comes in, and uh, he said, I represent Lawrence Riverboard Laboratories, uh, EGMG, which was buying the PFR2, uh, White Sands, who was buying the PFR1, and Holland Air Force Base, who was buying the PFR3, uh, which was a different than most of the things also. But anyway, George comes in and he said, uh, I'm here to cancel all three contracts. And he said, I said, well, come to, give us a chance. And uh, he said, no, he said, he, he said, but what happened, of course, the guy had needed us, needed somebody, is that his uh, prime engineer was good. Uh, and he was left with these orders, never going to do anything with it. And George Michael said, you can't do it. You don't have an engineer. You don't have and I said, well, you know, we joined the company to, to work on it. And I said, George, could you give me 90 days? Well, that, said, was only, right, that was only the second time that we were bankrupt. <laughs> there's, a, there's an add-on to the story of the French. That went on through the formal procurement process, and the, uh, uh, the various representatives of the uh, Department of Defense and the State Department and all have to vote on this. And clearly, the order was not going to go through. 
But about six months later, we got a, I guess it almost was received the mail, an order from the CIA for at that point a PFR-3. No advance notice, no discussion of what it was going to do, but and we got the order. And that was, I think, the government's way of uh, making up for the fact that they'd gotten the way of the rolling of procurement. So the next point I remember, though, is this uh, precision machine was delivered to the outskirts of Washington, somewhere up in the northwest, uh, the other side of the river from Georgetown. And as we did in those days, Ken Cordry was the person of choice to make a delivery. So uh, we, did, we didn't have uh, the internet at that time. But, uh, so I guess it was a phone call. Somebody's rep reporting that the machine is all apart on the sidewalk outside this three-story building. <laughs> it wouldn't fit in the elevator. <laughs> uh, we finally got there. And then, then it had to not only fit the elevator, it had to fit through the door. The whole second floor of the building was a screen room so that, uh, you know, no radio waves could go in or out. Uh, but it had to then fit through the door and be reassembled inside the screen room. And we never heard from those people again. <laughs> <laughs> changes of the company. At that point, we were going to make our fortune with programmable film readers. We felt that uh, film was a great recording media, and uh, that getting an interface between that and modern computers was going to make our fortunes. Uh, the, uh, the order for the CIA was the last. The, uh, but uh, it turned out that at that time, the aerospace industry had standardized on uh, 35 millimeter film and punch cards for handling large files of drawings for the uh, space program, for an airplane, um, and for the telephone system. So we uh, somehow or other fell heir to uh, the president of the Microfilm Association, George, George Harmon. Uh, and after uh, months of work, we were able to uh, imitate the image that one would get from a planetary camera uh, photographing a uh, line, lines per millimeter chart. Um, Bob did it by basically cheating on the, uh, uh, on the illumination, getting, the, getting it down to the point where it looked like 80 line pairs per millimeter. And uh, from then on, we were, uh, the company basically shifted from reading film to recording film. <coughs> By the way, someone asked me, I don't remember who, uh, would I tell something of the original history of Triple I, which led, uh, you know, was before I met these yes. two guys. I don't know, do you want to hear that or not? I don't know. No, we want to start talking. <laughs> oh, what? No, we want to start yeah. talking. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> That's good. good. Yes. Yes? Yes. Oh, then we'd have to vote. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, if anyone wants to hear that, you can let me know, or we, I don't know what you do. Yes. 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 I'll start. If you get bored, tell me, I'll shut up. Okay. Okay, so here's what happened. I was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, okay, and I was based at a place called Hanscom Field in Massachusetts. And the Air Force uh, lent me to Lincoln Laboratory, which was there and sort of forgot about me, which was nice from my perspective, okay? And so I, I got a chance to learn all about computers. And then I, I invented something called tree memory while I was there. And uh, by the way, this is a very funny thing. I invented this thing and, uh, you know, the Air Force couldn't care less one way or another and I wrote it up. And, Whatever. Uh, the result is that uh, that particular thing I invented is uh, the most commonly used information retrieval system in the United States today. For instance, Google runs with it and so on. Almost all retrieval systems use it. Whatever that's I don't know. Okay, so here's what was happening. I was working for BBN and uh, the world was very strange then, you know. Uh, there was a uh, nuclear war was probably going to happen, people thought, and all kinds of strange things like that. And, um, you know, 
uh, it's very hard to put you back into the psychology that existed then. But um, what happened is I and a, and a very good friend of mine, Raul Silver, who worked at BBM, decided to quit and go to Brazil. And the reason we wanted to go to Brazil is because this fantastic guy had just been elected president, a guy named uh, Quadros, a very uh, amazing person. Um, and he, he just seemed so amazing and uh, fantastic to us that we wanted to go and, a, and someone else from Bell Labs wanted to go. So the three of us decided to do that. And uh, so I told my boss at BBN, uh, we told him, we're leaving. He was very upset. That was Licklider, a guy. So, uh, but not long afterwards, the generals in Brazil um, uh, deposed Quadros, and so that ended that idea. Uh, so I went to Lick and said, okay, we don't have to leave. And he was, he said, look, you made me so upset telling me you're going to leave, so now leave. <laughs> so, said, okay, so we left. So um, we're suddenly out of a job, and we, I just called someone up at Digital and said, hey, I'm out of a job, and he said, I'll meet you for lunch. That was Harlan Anderson. He met us for lunch, and he agreed to hire both of us as consultants. So Rollo and I decided to create a company, okay? Now Rollo and I were, were such terrific friends. We re really liked each other, you know, and got along well and so on. We'd talk about this, that, and the other. And we discovered that together, we could get about one-tenth as much done as either of us could do by himself. <laughs> so, I felt very, very guilty, but I decided I was going to have to just break this up and, um, you know, go and start a company by myself. And I finally told him, and he said, well, you know, I've had the same thought and I've already got a job at MITRE. <laughs> so, so that worked out. So I went to digital and said, okay, I don't want to just sit in this office here consulting to you. I want to start a company. And I had no money whatsoever. I did, you know, I had no savings, I don't, none. So I worked a deal with digital where if I started a company, they would pay me my regular consulting rate for any number of hours I would bill them a week. So if I got outside business, they wouldn't get billed much. And if I got no outside business, I'd be full time. And I told him, well, there's one other thing you have to promise. I'm going to bill you at 5.30 on Friday afternoon. You have to pay me Monday morning. <laughs> and they said, OK. <laughs> so with that, I went and rented uh, 3,300 square feet of floor space in the mill in Maynard. <laughs> I, the guy says, OK, I need two months rent in advance. And I said, I'll pay you one month at the end of the month. And he said, OK. <laughs> so with no money whatsoever, I remember an accountant came in to set up my books. And he said, OK, what are your assets? 